Hello students, welcome to lesson number 85, where we're going to finally learn how to play the King's Indian Defense. And I'm planning to do it exactly like we've been doing with the Pitix Defense, guys. I'm going to teach you step by step from the ground up until you're ready to play it in tournament. So we're going to get started. There are a few things that I wanted to highlight to make this effective and make it easy for you guys to record and practice it later. So let's get to it. The first thing is that the main difference between the King's Indian Defense and the Pitix Defense, and by the way, if you've been following this course, you should be very familiar by now with the Pitix Defense. And you should also know a little bit about the King's Indian Defense because I keep making reference to it. Actually, our last lesson, lesson number 84, you saw me playing games with the King's Indian Defense. Today, we're just going to go more into detail about the plans and the different variations that the white pieces could do. So first things first, the Pyrrhix defense, guys, for those of you who know, is when you play that same system against e4, the king's pawn opening. Now, if we play it against d4, then this is going to be the king's Indian defense. So we're talking about knight f6, g6, bishop g7, e4. Notice that we never did d6 because there's no pawn on e4 to attack the knight. But the moment they do e4, we're going to do d6. Now knight f3, we castle and we get to the same setup. So this is the king's Indian defense because they started with the queen's pawn opening and they did c4. So this is the main difference. In the, in the Pyrrhic's defense, this pawn typically is not on c4. So with that out of the way, let me tell you guys the lines that we need to cover to make sure that you get everything you need to play this in tournaments. So just like in the Pyrrhic's defense, guys, many of the lines that the white pieces could choose are going to be the same thing. Like for instance, they could do f3. We know this against the Pyrrhics as the 150 attack. Now, since we're playing against the Queen's Pawn opening, this is going to be called the Samish variation. Now, the Samish is one of the most difficult ones for a lot of uh, King's Indian defense players, but I'm going to show you two ways to deal with it. So if you don't like one, you're going to like the other one. And trust me, this is not going to be a problem for you. Uh, many of you really liked the antidote that I gave you against the 150 attack. So you might also like one of these that I'm going to show you against the Samish. Now, the other thing they could do is they could do knight f3, which is the one that we're going to focus on today. There are two plans that I'm going to show you when they play the classical. And guys, by the way, there are other tips that I'm going to give you that even if you've been playing the King's Indian Defense for a while, maybe these tips could help you a lot. So stay tuned. And the other variations are we have pawn to f4, which if we compare it to the Pyrrhic's Defense, this would be like the, like the Austrian attack. But guys, this is not as good as the Austrian attack, in my opinion. The thing is that in this case, we don't have three pawns um, pushed to the center. We have four. This is actually the four pawn attack. And it's not that popular because there's, it's so hard to keep the four pawns without creating weaknesses. So we're going to go over it at some point anyways. The other variations, let me make sure that I'm not missing anything, is G3. We haven't talked about this one against the Pyrrhics, but we're going to. Now, it is not as dangerous against the Pyrrhics as it is against the King's Indian Defense because everything that you're going to learn, guys, in the classical, the reason why many people choose to play the King's Indian Defense is not going to work against the, the Fianchetto variation. So this is something that I'm going to show you also a few ways to play against it, but I know we have to cover that. And then there are other variations that we have to review, but there's one more thing that I wanted to say here. We also have to cover this variation where the white pieces play sort of like the, the London system against the King's Indian defense. And this is not a big deal. Like the London is typically not that aggressive, but many people have a hard time dealing with it when they play the King's Indian defense setup. So I'm going to show you two ways to deal with it. And again, if you don't like one, you're going to like the other one. I'm going to show you the one that I play currently. And I'm also going to show you the one that I used to play before. But let me just put everything back and let's start from the very beginning. I don't want you to get confused, guys. If you follow what I'm going to teach you, trust me, you're going to get this right. You're going to understand the plans, the ideas, which is what I really want. Now, one last thing before we get started. Notice that I'm here on Lee Chess. I'm doing this because I want you guys to do the same thing. As we go through all of these lessons on the King's Indian Defense, create a, a, a free account on Lee Chess. You go to learn then you go to study and you can create your study. I'm going to call this one King's Indian Defense and I'm going to hit start, chapter one, fine. Actually, let me put 
classical for this chapter chapter one and create chapter and let's get started let me just flip the board because we're going to play uh we're going to learn it from the black pieces perspective and let's get started all right guys so this is going to start again with the move pawn to d4 and here's my first tip for you even if you've been playing this for a while you might find this tip useful Typically, the king's Indian defense, again, since we don't have the pawn on e4, we start with knight f6 right away, and then c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4. Now, we do d6, right? This is the way it goes, and feel free to play like this, because it's perfectly fine. But, when my opponent plays d4 and I go knight f6, many people like to do bishop g5, which is fine. You could do knight e4, you could do g6, but the problem is that after they take, you take back, this is not what we are used to. And you could play it, you're gonna get nice games with it, but I just wanna keep it consistent with what I know. I don't really enjoy these double pawns. So the reason why I'm saying this is because this little tip might make the difference. So what I do is when they do pawn to d4, instead of doing knight f6 right away, I do pawn to g6. And now this move doesn't really make much sense. And then after c4, I go knight f6. So it's the same thing as doing knight f6 first and then g6. Now if they do bishop g5, I could do bishop g7. And when they take, I could take with the bishop, if they ever take. So just keep that in mind, guys. Um, knight c3, bishop g7, e4. Now I need to be careful with this move. Not a big deal, but d6. And now they could choose to do the Samish, to do the Fianchero. They could do um, the four pawn attack, or they could do the classical, which is the one we're going to be focusing on today. So after they do knight f3, I'm going to castle. And now after bishop e2, I'm going to show you guys two plans. And let me explain what I mean. The classical way to play this is with e5 right away. And I'm going to use a game that I'm going to show you played by Kasparov, where he uses this right away. And I'm going to show you another game, guys, where I use the ideas from Kasparov's game, with e5 right away and I use it in this variation that you saw in lesson number 84 where I do knight a6. It looks very weird but it makes a lot of sense. You're going to like it. If you don't, that's fine. You can keep this one but I really want to show you this because this is what I'm playing lately guys. It's just going to save you so much time and it's way simpler to play as well in my opinion. So once you learn both, you're going to make your decision. You're going to keep the one you like the most but I feel like I have to teach you both. Now, why do I have to teach you e5 right away if at the end of the day i think this one is, is going to be a better fit for you well the thing is guys that if you really want to learn the king's indian defense you have to review games played with e5 by all of these great players like kasparov uh, fisher nakamura you have to review all of the ideas and the plans the king's indian defense is an opening that i started playing with the pedix from very early in my in my chess career and i only played e5 and i learned all of the plans so what i did later when I started to play knight a6, I just used those same plans into this variation. You're going to see it's the same thing. It's just that knight a6 gives you some perks that I really enjoy. So anyways, let's get started with e5 right away. This is going to be a game played by Kasparov where it is going to allow us to understand the main plans and ideas. Now, guys, I'm going to assume you've never seen this before and I need to explain why e5 is safe here, even though they have two attackers and we only have one defender well what makes this move okay is that if they take and you take back and then if they take with the knight you have this idea of the discovered attack on the knight so typically you want to take the queen first bishop takes and now you go knight takes e4 get your pawn back and if they take you collect that knight and of course this is something that the white pieces don't want to get into it's just you get your pawn back and they don't have anything out of this so now you know why Pawn to e5 makes sense and is completely safe. But with that said, guys, when I first started playing the King's Indian defense, they just told me that same thing. They told me, don't worry about e5. If they take, you take back. They take with the knight. And after you trade queens, you have the discovered attack on the knight. But what happened was that I started to play this and someone came along and they did the exchange variation, which is perfectly fine. And then instead of taking on e5, they traded queens and then bishop g5. Now, as simple as this looks, it could get really tricky if you don't know what you're doing with the black pieces. Like, if you just did h6, well, they're going to take the knight, followed by knight d5, hitting c7, hitting f6, right? Also, even if you did, I don't know, a move like knight b to d7, they could even castle, pinning the knight, and 
it's going to be really uncomfortable. Guys, it's not like you shouldn't play it. Like there are ways to handle this. Like again, if they take, you take, queen takes, um, bishop g5, like you could do moves like rook e8 and you're going to be fine. But here's one of the main things that you're going to feel way better if you play knight a6. If I go all the way back, they go bishop e2 and I go knight a6. When they do castle, now is when you guys are going to do e5. So look at the difference. We could do e5 right away. Or we could do knight a6, which is what I do now, followed by e5. When we do e5 right now, if they choose to do the exchange variation and then they trade queens, the same thing. We know that if they take on e5, you have the discovered attack on that knight. Now, if they did this variation, you could actually just do h6, bishop takes, bishop takes, and then this move is not that dangerous because this knight is already protecting c7. So now I could just go back, I could do even king g7, and my knight is protecting c7. Now, this is not the main reason why we do knight a6, but it is an additional benefit of developing the knight to a6. So it makes this exchange variation way simpler than when you don't have the knight on a6. So let me go back. And guys, let me actually go all the way back, because this repetition, like I always say, is going to help us remember everything. So d4, remember, knight f6 is the main line, but I like to do g6 first, then knight f6, I see three, bishop g7. Now that they did e4, I'm going to do d6, knight f3, castle, bishop e2, and then again, I like to do knight a6, but let's take a look at e5 first. Now, after e5, the main line is castle, and now knight to c6. Notice that they're not doing knight a6. This is the classical way to play this. I played it like this for many years, and it was so much fun. There's there's a lot to learn from, from this. So after knight c6, they have the five and automatically, those of you following this course, you have heard me say, when the center gets locked, we're going to do knight e7, you saw it in the pick's defense, then the other knight gets out of the way to do f5. Our target, whenever the position is like this, is going to be the pawn in front of our most forward pawn. This is our most forward pawn. Our target is going to be e4. Now for the white pieces, guys, the most forward pawn is d5, so their target is going to be d6, so they're going to try to break on c5. Now, after, again, in this game, after d5, knight e7, and then in this game, guys, the white pieces decided to do knight e1. Now, one of the reasons why I changed from this variation to knight e6 is because there's this uh, variation called, the I think in English you pronounce bayonet, where they do pawn to b4 right away and they just get to c5 before you can do much. Now, it doesn't mean that it refuted the king's in defense or anything like that. It's just that when you get to a certain level, they really give you a hard time. So I said, you know what, knight a6 is going to allow me to do exactly the same thing you're going to see here, but it is going to sort of slow down the attack on the queen side. At least that's my experience. Again, when we go over both, you're going to choose whichever you like the most. Anyways, in this game, again, they went knight e1. And then Kasparov just continued with the plan to break on, on f5. So after knight e1, knight d7, guys, this knight typically goes to d7, e8, h5. The point is we want to do f5, and then that knight is going to go back to f6. So he chose to do knight to d7, then bishop e3, f5, pawn to f3. And again, I'm not going to even go too deep into this because you've seen this plan many times by now. The center is locked, we're going to expand with f5. So f5, f3, f4, and then pawn to f2. So again, it's all about pushing these pawns because the center is locked. If these pawns were in here, guys, the white pieces could easily attack us through the diagonals and so on. But since that's not the case, we're going to try to keep the center locked and we're going to expand on the king side. So after bishop f2, we have g5. Look, our most forward pawn the pawn in front is this one, so that's going to be our new target. So pawn to g5 happened, then the white pieces do pawn to b4, same plan, trying to get to c5, and like I mentioned in lesson number 69, guys, if the white pieces are successful here, they're going to win material. Maybe they win pawns, they win a rook. If we are successful on the king side, we're going to checkmate the king. So this is one of the main reasons why I really like this. So anyways, after b4, Remember, these knights that just came back to allow us to expand on the, on the king's side, they're going to transfer now to the king's side to help. So knight f6, trying to come back over here. Then finally pawn to c5. 
we're not going to take, we want to keep this locked. So after c5, we just go knight to g6, both knights to the king side. c takes d6, c takes d6, and after rook c1, there is a plan that you already saw again on lesson number 69, where we just did rook f7, bishop f8, rook g7. And you have actually seen this rook lift a few times, guys, where we just want to put the rook on the g file because that's what we're going to open. So rook f7, pawn to a4, bishop f8. This bishop, you're going to see how it's going to help us with d6 if they ever put pressure on it. And at the same time, it allows the rook to get on the g file. So bishop f8, then pawn to a5, bishop d7, knight goes to b5. Guys, we don't want to give up this bishop, and this is very, very important. We need the light square bishop, believe it or not, to, for this attack on the king side. And you're going to see how it makes more sense later. So after knight b5, they just went pawn to g4, finally making contact. And after knight c7, this is the game that I was mentioning back in lesson 69. I told you that there was a game uh, that Kasparov played and he sacrificed a rook. Well, this is the one. I didn't feel like doing it, but this is the game where he actually sacrificed a rook. And again, guys, this is what you get when you play the king in defense. After knight c7, Kasparov just did pawn to g3, making contact. Once he makes contact here, he takes initiative and the white pieces need to start defending. So h takes g3, f takes g3, bishop takes, and now knight h5. You're going to see how these knights now, along with the rook, along with the queen and the bishop, they put a lot of pressure on the king side. So after knight h5, we have bishop f2. This bishop becomes really important for the, for the white pieces. Then knight goes to f4, putting pressure on g2 already. So you're going to see how the queen comes over or even the rook to join that knight. So they finally take the rook. And now, guys, we're down the rook. We better put them in checkmate or else we're going to be getting to a losing position. So queen g5, putting pressure on g2 right away. It is defended. So the white pieces just ignored it and they went knight c7 trying to get out of here. But... At this point, I want you guys to pause the video and see if you can come up with the next move for the black pieces. Nothing too crazy, just pretend you're playing this in one of your tournament games. What would you do in this position? Well, guys, the move is not h3 check. Remember, this pawn is pinned. So check, the king went to h1. Now we eliminate that bishop, rook takes, and after knight g3 check, the queen comes to h4 threatening checkmate. So just like that, those knights that we moved back and then back over here to the king side, we sacrificed the pawns. Look, we don't have any of these pawns because we needed open lines for our pieces to maneuver and attack. Now, after knight g3, we're threatening checkmate on h1. So the white pieces went rook f1. And now, guys, there's a move that I really like from this position. It's not a crazy tactic. It's not a sacrifice right now. But it is a, a move that whenever I do it, and I've done it in many of my games, I really enjoy it. And actually, you're going to see it in the game that I'm going to show you that I played myself using the knight a6 variation. So I played the knight a6 variation, I unleashed a similar attack, and I even got to use this, op this move that you're going to see right now. The move is the following. The black pieces are calculating this. Queen h1, king comes over, and even if we continue to attack that king, the king could escape to the queen side. And... Don't be surprised if you see this in one of your games. You put so much pressure on the king and they always have this resource of just running to the other side. But the move that Kasparov found here, guys, is a move that deals with that problem. And he actually did bishop h6. I really like this move because this bishop many times is just here like doing nothing, just protecting this pawn. It is blocked, but it comes out later in the game to become one of the most important pieces at the moment. So bishop a6, controlling a3 more than anything else. And then in this game, after rook c3, we have checkmate in two moves. So feel free to pause the video and see if you can find a two move checkmate. Well, guys, the move is queen h4, check, king goes to f2, and then knight e4, checkmate. So check and checkmate. The pawn is pinned by the rook, they cannot take it. And this bishop is controlling a3, the knight is controlling g3. So checkmate. All right, guys, don't worry if this was too fast, if this attack that you just saw on the king side is a little bit too crazy, because I'm going to show you now another game where I get a similar uh, attack, 
but I started with the move Knight A6 like I showed you before. And you're going to see why I like Knight A6 more than doing E5 right away. So let's go all the way back. And again, this repetition is going to help you remember the opening moves. All right, so again, first move D4, Knight F6 is the main line. I like to do G6 to not let them do Bishop G5 uh, right after Knight F6. So C4, Knight F6. Sometimes I even do Bishop G7, Knight C3, D6, and then I do Knight F6 or Knight F6, E4, D6. Now, after Knight F3, Castle, Bishop E2, we already saw this game where they did e5. Now, I myself, like you saw in lesson 84, I like to do knight a6. And after they castle, guys, I do e5 right away. That's it. We know already why they're not going to take on e5, or at least why it's safe to do e5, because if they do the exchange variation, we simply take back and we have the idea of the discovered attack. So I'm not going to go over the discovered attack, but we have to know, guys, from this moment on, we need to know what to do if they push, like we saw in, in this other game. We need to know what to do if they do bishop e3. We need to know what to do if they do something like rook e1. Now, not a big deal, but we need to know them. And we're going to talk about them little by little. Now, in this game, they chose to do pawn to d5. Guys, the main idea is the following. This knight that looks so weird, we know it is going to come to c5 to occupy this square. So we don't we know that knights are not good on the rim, but this is just momentary. We're planning to bring it towards the center right away. And the thing is that when the knight comes towards the center, then we're hitting on e4 with a tempo. They need to defend it. So we have two knights versus one. When the queen comes and defend, it gives us just enough time to prevent them from doing b4. So we do pawn to a5. Now let's talk about this for a moment. This move a5 it allows us to keep the knight on a very good square, but you're going to see that when we start attacking on the king side, which is what we like, at least what I like from the king side and defense, this expansion on the king side, we're going to get it done. And in the meantime, we're going to paralyze their queen side attack. And this is a little bit like what we talked about in the in lesson, I want to say 82, where we talked about prophylaxis, that we sort of paralyze what they have to do on, on their side. And then only then we exp we continue with our plan. So you're going to see how this pawn is going to prevent them from expanding here, at least not at the speed that they typically do it. So anyways, after pawn to a5, there are a few ways that the white pieces could continue here. They could do bishop e3 right away, which we don't really mind. They could do trying to expand anyways with a3 and b4. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this game. Now, before we move any further, one more time, let's go all the way back. Sorry, guys, for the for, for the back and forth. But again, this repetition is going to help you remember and memorize. So knight f6, g6, bishop g7, e4, d6, knight f3, I castled, bishop e2. And right here, instead of e5, knight a6, castle, and now pawn to e5. If they push, the knight immediately uses that square, hitting e4. They have to protect it. With queen c2, they could do something like knight d2. It doesn't matter to us. We're going to do pawn to a5. Now, if they did bishop e3, they know that they, they cannot kick us out with the pawn. They might do this. Well, you should know by now, guys, this is the good bishop that they have. This bishop, if you look at their pawns in the center, especially the most forward pawn, it is the same color as that bishop. So it makes this bishop really bad. And in contrast, this bishop is a good bishop. So they're not going to give it up. They shouldn't give it up. If they give it up strategically, you have a better game. Now, I myself, like you shouldn't worry too much about it. You could always take back. But I myself like to do b6 because if they take, I want to take with the b pawn. And now, again, guys, whenever they try to expand here, it is not going to be so easy. So I'm going to be able to move my knight and do f5, right? Now, the other plan they could do is simply do try to do b4, uh, make it work. So they could do a3. But in that case, we could do something like a4. And if they do b4, well, en passant. So they're going to have a hard time breaking on b4. What could they do, guys? The way that you typically see people doing it, they do b3 first, then bishop d7. We need to develop this bishop. In that game from Kasparov, you don't typically see the bishop coming here so early. Instead, they hurry up to do f5. Here, we're going to take the moment to develop that bishop a3 now, so we don't have a4, although sometimes you could do it, like you could do a4, knight b3, so keep this in mind. 
Now, let me go back. Let's say that I ignore that, guys. I could do 98. Then they cannot do before yet because, look, there's going to be a, a pin here. So if they do before, we take and they simply cannot take back. So they need to connect the rooks and that's when the bishop comes to e3. Guys, if the bishop goes to g5, we kick it out and then we continue with our plan. We're going to do f5 anyway, so it's not going to make a big difference to us. And the same tempo that we wasted going here and then here is the same tempo that they wasted going here and then back, right? So let me go back. Um, if they go bishop e3, then again, b6. You don't have to do it. I find it myself really useful. And then you're going to be ready to do f5, f4. And again, guys, uh, I don't want to make this video too long. If you go to the last lesson, lesson 84, you're going to see me using this same plan like twice. So you can use that as reference. Now, let me go back and show you what actually happened in the game that I'm going to show you. And again, <laughs> I'm going to go all the way back. So this is a game that I played where my opponent did d4. I did oh, all the way back. So pawn to b4. I did g6. My opponent did e4. Then I did d6. Now, many times I do g6 and my opponents transpose into the pitic defense. It's like doing e4, d4, knight c3. So notice how I'm doing g6, d6. It looks like I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Anyways, then they went c4, knight f6, knight c3, bishop g7, knight f3, and castle. And just like that, we transposed into this main variation. Now, after I castled bishop e2, knight a6, they castled, and pawn to e5. We got to the same position, guys, but my opponent here, they went bishop e3. Now, we're not going to go too deep into this variation. If I see that you show interest in the king's and defense, of course, we have to review this in detail. But the move that I like to do here, there are many variations. You could look at the theory. I like to do knight g4 right now. And after bishop g5, then queen e8. Again, this is theory. If you look at the encyclopedia, you're going to see this as part of the theory. After queen e8, the main move that I get a lot is h3, but in this game, my opponent decided to do pawn to d5. And notice how I quickly identified the pattern. The center is locked. We know what comes along with that. Target the pawn in front <laughs> of our most forward pawn. So I'm going to do f5 at some point. So the moment they did d5, I went f6, kicking the bishop out. Bishop went all the way back to c1, and now f5. Right away, guys, I don't want to waste time, so I just went f5 right away. Then knight to g5, I went knight f6, just going back. I don't want them to take on, on g4. And remember, we just moved this knight many times just to have time to do f5, and then the knight comes back to f6. So after knight f6, f3, h6, kicking the knight out, the knight went back to h3, and now pawn to f4. Again, the same ideas that I saw in Kasparov's game, I'm using them here. Now my target is going to be f3, so I'm going to do g5 and g4. So after pawn to f4, this knight is trying to regroup, going to, to f2, pawn to g5, knight goes to d3, and now h5. I want to break on g4, but I need to get ready for it. So pawn to h5, bringing more pieces to break on g4. In the meantime, the white pieces need to be trying to break on c5. But I feel more comfortable, guys. Notice how it's not like in the other game. It's not like they have before already to do c5. My knight is healed. That might help uh, support that c5 break. But the downside is also that I don't have this knight on the king side. So this is something else to keep in mind. Now, at this point, pawn to b4. They're going to follow through with their plan. But now I already made contact on the king side. So pawn to g4, c5, g3. And we talked about this before. When we do this g3, we have to be careful because if we close, if we seal the king side, we have no way in. Now, we also talked about how this bishop is extremely important in the king's Indian defense because typically it doesn't do anything, but at the right time, we're going to sacrifice it on h3. So after pawn g3, my opponent didn't do h3. I could just have brought my queen over at the right time, sacrifice on h3. Instead, they took, I took right back, and now all I need is my queen to get to h2, and this pivot pawn is going to help me do checkmate. So if you get your pawn that far, then most likely you're going to have a very comfortable attack afterwards. So after pawn takes on g3, bishop g5, I don't think this move is that accurate. This bishop is extremely important. Again, 
and they're allowing me to improve my queen with a tempo. So I'm hitting that bishop, then queen to d2, protecting their bishop, knight h7, putting pressure on it, and then after bishop e3, again, I want my queen to get to h2. So I went queen f6. Guys, maybe this is not the most accurate move, the perfect plan, but I knew exactly what I wanted, so it just made sense to me. So after queen f6, rook f to c1. Remember how I told you that sometimes they just run away? Well, always keep that in mind. Sometimes we sacrifice everything just to find out that they are in time to leave. So anyways, after rook f to c1, I just went queen h4. They're trying to run away. And now we have to be very careful here. Sometimes we have check, we collect on e2, and we even get past pawns. But I'm thinking here that if I do queen h1, they're going to have bishop g1 problem solved. So what I did instead was after king f1, I did a move that I learned in games like the one that we just went over from Kasparov. So pause the video here, guys, and see if you can find the next move for the black pieces. Well, guys, if you pause the video and you came up with a move queen h1, well, you're correct. To be honest, the move that I did is not the right move. The best move happens to be queen h1, they block, then you continue with h4, h3, and this is just very nice, a very nice position. Now, I got, I just play mechan, well, not mechanically, not mechanically, but I really got, I think I got excited to use that idea of bishop h6. So I'm thinking if I go here, the bishop is the one that can block. So I thought of bishop h6, if they take, then checkmate. But in reality, it's not forcing anything. They could just have done king e1 and escape. So that was a mistake on my on my end. I think I'm still winning if they go king e1, but it's not the strongest move. Anyways, I did bishop h6, and my opponent did not take advantage of that of that mistake. So the moment I went bishop h6, they went bishop d1. Then I went check. They cannot block here now because I'm getting that that queen. So king e2. Queen takes you to king e1. And after this, I just finished the game in three more moves, guys. I just went queen h1. I'm willing to use my rook to help me finish that king. So the king went up, check, and then checkmate. And notice how we uh, finished the game on the king side with this expansion. But the white pieces did not have it so easy to attack here. Now, is this going to be like that every time? No, guys, many times. Even when you do this knight 6 variation, the white pieces can expand and get you in trouble over here, but you still get the, the king's side, like we like it when we play the king's in defense. I hope this was not too much information. I hope that you really found this useful. And if I see enough interest from you, I'm going to do like I did with the Pyrrhic's defense. I'm going to go into all of the variations that I showed you before, and little by little, we're going to get it ready to play in tournaments. For now, feel free to give it a try if you play online. You already know some of the main ideas of the classical line. And like always, we're going to talk in the comments. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you want to learn more about this. If not, I just put it aside and we continue with our plan. But I think some of you are going to appreciate if we actually learn the Kinsina defense little by little. So with that said, I will see you guys in our next lesson.